Okay, so we've landed at our next model. We're at our next destination. We're taking a look at a uh, model of the spinal cord, actually. Now, first thing first, you got to get your bearings straight to understand what it is that you're actually looking at. What we have is we have the spinal cord, which is here, and that's it. That's the actual spinal cord. Your spinal cord is really not all that large. So I know what you're asking. If this is the spinal cord, then what's all the rest of this other stuff? Well, the rest of all of this other stuff happens to be, for example, this is a cervical vertebrae. And you remember from the bones that cervical vertebrae are the only vertebrae that have three foramen, three holes. So this right here is the vertebral foramen that houses the spinal cord itself. And then these are transverse foramen which houses uh, blood vessels and these two just happen to be the uh, vertebral arteries that are passing through these transverse foramen. So we've got the spinal cord here and there's some things that we need to understand. For example, let's zoom in on the layers so we know exactly what layers are helping to protect our spinal cord. If we look out here, we can zoom in kind of close, we can see that this is the periosteum and the periosteum is a layer that actually uh, separates bone tissue from other tissues. And of course, we just said that this spinal cord segment is inside of a cervical vertebrae. So that makes sense. Then we see the epidural fat, which is here. Pay close attention to the blood vessels that are inside running through the epidural fat. And then we see the first layer of our meningens. Now, when I say meningens, yeah, I'm talking about the same meningens that if it gets infected or it becomes inflamed, it can cause meningitis. This is the very same meningens. Your meningens is actually made up of three different layers of tissue. So the very first layer is here where you see this weird, awkward looking G slash nine, whatever that could be. That is the dura mater or the dura mater whichever you want to pronounce, tomato, tomato, just put the thing on a sandwich and call it a day. But that's the dura mater or the dura mater. Dura means durable or tough. Matter or mater means mother. So it's a tough mother. Please don't fill in the last blank to that. But you've got the dura mater or dura mater. If you go below this little crease, you get down to this layer. And this layer happens to be the arachnoid layer. What's interesting about the arachnoid layer is the fact that if you looked at the tissue under a microscope, you'd notice that the way the fibers are interwoven, it actually looks like a spider web. Really, you ought to look it up sometime. Uh, and so that's where it got its arachnoid name. So you have the dura mater, then you have the arachnoid layer, and then the closest layer to the spinal cord is the pia mater or the pia mater. This is this white layer that you see going all the way around the actual spinal cord. And that layer, pia, means close or intimate. Mater or matter means mother. So intimate or close mother. So we've got those three layers that make the meningens. And if we continue to zoom out just a little bit more, but not too much because we want to stay on the spinal cord just for a second. I'm going to point out some key things to you. Check this out. This whole butterfly looking structure all across here, that happens to be your gray matter. Uh, so you've got all your gray matter, which is here. All of that is gray matter. And then all of the whitish material that surrounds it is known as the white matter. Now, something you need to remember about the gray matter. Gray matter contains cell bodies of neurons, and those cell bodies are responsible for processing information. So whenever we see gray matter, the first thing that pops up in our head is information processing. That's where you usually find what we call nuclei. Nuclei are, are groups or you know, more than one nucleus that is, happens to be a group of cell bodies that are together that process this info. When we see white matter, that tells us that that's where we have axons. And remember, axons always send information. They're like DSL cables. So information always travels down axons. Axons don't 
figure anything out. They don't think. They just send the information that the cell bodies have been processing. So we're more than likely to find tracks passing through this white matter. Up here, we have a horn. It's a specific area of gray matter within the spinal cord. That particular horn is what's known as a posterior horn or a dorsal horn. This particular horn over here is what's known as a lateral horn. And this particular horn over here is what's known as an anterior horn or a ventral horn. Now each horn has its own groups of nuclei within it. For example, over here at the dorsal or uh, posterior horn, we're going to probably be the, in the location where we wind up finding more sensory nuclei, both somatic sensory nuclei and visceral sensory nuclei. Uh, we'll also find over here in the lateral horn and the anterior or ventral horn, this is where we're going to find more of our motor nuclei. So we wind up seeing all of these different nuclei spread throughout the gray matter. Both sides of gray matter are interconnected by a bridge of gray matter known as the uh, commissure, or better known as the gray commissure. Uh, the commissure actually means bridge. So uh, both sides of the gray matter are linked together by this gray commissure. And in the very center there, there is something commonly referred to as the central canal. Now, if we zoom out, we're going to zoom to one side. We want to see how information gets in and out of the spinal cord. And if you look closely, you'll see where the spinal nerve, which remember, a spinal nerve is a mixed nerve. It has axons within it that belong to both sensory neurons and motor neurons. And so this information passes through the spinal nerve, and then uh, let's, let's take it this way. Let's say there's some incoming sensory information. Incoming sensory information goes in through the spinal nerve. It passes through the dorsal root. That giant lobed area here is the dorsal root ganglion. That's where the cell bodies are actually located inside of uh, that dorsal root. I guess we'll have to take another, another video or another time to explain why the cell bodies are there and why you have a dorsal root ganglion and you don't have a ventral root ganglion. We'll have to talk about the uh, anatomical differences in neurons, the difference between bipolar, unipolar, and multipolar, and anaxonic. But the cell bodies of this neuron happen to be in this ganglion. And so the sensory information continues down the axon through this dorsal root and then into the spinal cord, where the spinal cord gets a chance to process that information. Specifically, if it's a reflex, then the information doesn't require a higher level of thought. If it's going to require any higher level of thought outside of a reflex, it's going to try to take a trip up the ascending track to your brain. But if this is just a simple reflex, uh, let's say just you know touching something that's hot, then that information, uh, that stimulus is going to go right through the gray matter and it's going to exit with a motor command that's going to pass back out of the spinal cord through this ventral root, through the ventral root, and on back out the exact same spinal nerve. And that brings us to a close on the spinal cord.